You're back. Okay. <laughs> Start over. Welcome everyone to the uh, second of our author workshops um, sponsored or presented to you by the Botanical Society of America. Uh, this is the second of two workshops um, that we've hosted. Uh, the first was presented, Teresa, maybe you should just advance them for me. So next slide. There you go. <laughs> the first of our um, presentations was last week and hosted by my colleague, Teresa Cully, who's the editor in chief of Applications in Plant Sciences. And a recording of that presentation is available at YouTube um, and the uh, URL is below. My name is Pamela Diggle. Um, I'm the editor in chief of the American Journal of Botany and also a professor at the University of Connecticut. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, the editor's perspective. And that is the, um, with the motivation that understanding something about the publication process, how your paper actually moves through that process uh, will help you maximize your chances of um, a successful uh, publication. And uh, so joining me in uh, this presentation, uh, uh, Teresa will um, be here to uh, help with her perspectives and answer your questions. And um, next slide. And we also have a panel who will um, of people who are accomplished writers and reviewers, and also have um, a variety of experiences with journals. And they'll be adding their perspectives along the way. So I'm going to ask them to uh, introduce themselves. Um, and Rocio, will you start? Yeah, sure. Well, um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to these sessions. I'm Rocio from Argentina, and I'm working as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Colorado at Boulder, and also here at the Natural History Museum in London. Um, so, well, I'm working with evolution of a particular group of plants in Solanaceae. Um, well, I hope that I can, I can help you with my view of this, this process. Thank you. Nora? Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, my name is Nora Mitchell. I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. Um, I'm also a UConn EEB alum, so hi to Pam and Rachel as well. Um, I'm also on the publications committee for the Botanical Society of America, and I'm an associate editor at Ecology and Evolution. In the past, I was a reviewing editor for apps. So I'm excited to be here. Um, my research focuses on hybridization and evolution. I've done work in South Africa with uh, Rachel, and now I'm working on sunflowers in North America. Great. Rachel? Hi, um, I'm Rachel Prunier. I am currently an adjunct professor at the University of California in Los Angeles. Um, I'm also a plant evolutionary biologist, um, mostly focusing on plants in South Africa, but also I've picked up a couple of Californian um, species to work on. And um, I teach science writing at the college level and do a fair amount of reviewing. So I'm really excited to be here to talk with you guys. Great. Is Marcelo here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here too. And I hope I can contribute. And I'm, um, I'm interested in plant anatomical diversity and evolution. And I am currently also the editor in chief of the IAWA journal, which stands for the International Association of Wood Anatomists. So. Okay, thank you. All right, next slide. And okay, Pam, so you might want to see if you can control. I think you can. Okay. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we spent quite some time talking about uh, last week was um, the importance of actually choosing a journal and things to think about when you choose a journal. And, um, but I think that uh, a successful submission process really starts with choosing the right journal. And so I wanted to go back um, and highlight some of the, the things that we talked about last week, um, assuming that uh, following up on last week, you have a really great paper written and are ready to submit. And to, so what some of the things to think about uh, when you are, um, and you should be thinking about these as you're writing. Let's see, that's not working. Oh, there we go. 
Okay, so, um, and again, this is, these are choices that you should have made while you're writing your paper because it's really important that as you write, you're writing for your chosen audience um, and keeping that in mind so that you're telling the best story uh, to, the, to the audience that you think will be most re receptive to what you have to say. And so when thinking about the journal, make sure that the topic is appropriate to the journal. You can go to um, a variety of journals and read their descriptions. Journals will publish what, what it is they wanna see and what their aims and scopes are. And I'll show you that in a minute. You can look at recent issues of the journal to understand more about what they're actually publishing, regardless of what they say on their website. You can look at the composition of the editorial board uh, to see who's, who's on the editorial board. Those people will be handling your papers and what kind of expertise do they have. You might want to consider the cost. Um, are there page charges, publication charges? How long does it take for a paper to be published? Um, and whether there are open access options. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, you should also consider the impact factor and other metrics that measure the, the impact of the journal. Um, uh, international authors, if you're coming from a developing country, you can ask about fee waivers. Um, and uh, those inquiries are always welcome. Um, and if in doubt, contact the editorial office. There's real human beings behind those websites and they're always really happy to talk to you. And so I wanted to take a minute to introduce the um, editorial office for the Botanical Society journals, the American Journal of Botany and Applications in Plant Sciences. And so our uh, managing editor for uh, American Journal of Botany is Amy McPherson, who's um, on the line here um, with us to answer questions. Uh, Beth Parada is the managing editor for uh, Applications in Plant Sciences. She's also with us. And Rich Hund is the production editor for both uh, journals. And he's also with us to answer any questions. And so um, I think many of us have trouble understanding uh, how to think about open access. So I've asked uh, Amy if she'll talk briefly about open access. Thank you, Pam, and thanks everybody for joining us here today. Um, we could talk about open access uh, for hours if you like, but I, I think that we don't have time for that today. Um, basically, there's a couple of open access options. One is a gold open access, which is basically the paper is um, free to for everyone um, upon publication. Uh, there's no barriers um, or subscriptions uh, needed to, to view the work once it's published. Um, that's usually um, published with an article uh, publication charge um, and they vary all over the place from $500 to $3,500 or more uh, depending on the journal and depending on lots of um, situations. Um, free and open access is um, uh, is a, a little different. Um, there aren't any um, author processing charges, it's not available immediately upon publication. There are some versions of it that can be made uh, freely available or um, they're freely available after an embargo period. So after a year, all of the articles of the American Journal of Botany are, are uh, freely accessible um, without a subscription. So that's our, that's our green open access version of that. Um, I've included three links here that might help um, you after this um, discussion um, to, to find out more. And one is, um, the author uh, services page on Wiley, um, which will walk you through many steps as far as um, choosing where to find a journal. If you want to publish open access, here are your options, um, ethical considerations, the whole gamut. Um, and the other two are from um, a blog that a lot of us in the scholarly publishing world pay attention to, which is called the Scholarly Kitchen. And the first uh, link that there is Seeking Sustainability, Publishing Models for an Open Access Age, which gives you more information than you ever wanted to know about the various um, uh, things to think about or, and the way different people view open access um, from the librarian's perspective to the, the um, author's perspective to the publisher's perspective. And then the, the last one is um, if you thought that maybe um, open access shouldn't really cost anything, we're just putting things up online, um, it's another um, entry on, in the blog of uh, 102 things that journal publishers do. So you may not be aware of all the things that go on behind the scenes um, with your article. So if you're curious, um, that's, a, that's um, some place to look. So I'm happy to answer any questions about open access 
either on this call or um, afterwards. Uh, we have one of our journals, Applications of Plant Sciences, is open access journal. All the papers there are open access. Um, there are discounts for members, depending on how, or be, members of the Botanical Society of America, um, depending on length of mem membership. But if you're not a member, you can also just pay a slightly higher fee. It's the same with the American Journal of Botany. We have a 50% discount for, for members. Um, it, it could be any author that's a member or otherwise we have no um, author uh, publication charges for regular articles. So. Okay, thank you, Amy. Yes, welcome. All right, so, so um, let's assume we've written a brilliant paper or that you've written a brilliant paper and uh, you're, you're, you've chose a journal, but just to um, sort of reinforce uh, looking at to, for a description of the journal, this is the author information page from the American Journal of Botany. And whatever journal you choose to publish in, you should go straight to this page, um, which will give you step-by-step -step instructions for uh, how to prepare your paper to submit to that journal. Uh, and so this is the American Journal of Botany, Aims and Scope describes the kinds of things that the journal is interested in publishing. Uh, AJB is a general botanical journal and so essentially publishes in all areas of plant biology, which is, is what it says here. Um, and of course, you'll get a different message if you go to the Journal of Plant Physiology, which is not necessarily going to publish your paper in systematics. Um, so, and then if you go to Applications in Plant Sciences, it will tell you uh, some of the things that Amy just said, that it's uh, online only open access, um, and then it, it's uh, primarily devoted to publishing innovative tools and protocols in all areas of plant sciences. So the journals have different aims and scopes and they spell those out pretty plainly at the, um, on the instructions for authors, and you'll find that for every journal. So on the same page, uh, you'll also find preparing the submission, which is the next place you should go to for information about what to do next. Um, let's see where I am. Ah, I'm losing my place. Can we go back, Teresa? Ah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, different journals have are um, uh, are what do I want to say that they vary in their strictness about uh, uh, how stringently they want you to adhere to their um, guidelines for preparing the submissions. So some journals are really really picky about the um, how you the format of your paper when it goes in. Some some journals are less picky. Until you're familiar with the journal, it's to your advantage to follow those directions um, uh, just so that the submission process goes quickly. And you'll also find that um, reviewers have different expectations. So some reviewers are really familiar with the journal and they expect your paper to be in a particular format when it comes in and they get really grouchy if it's not in that format. And so you can just avoid that uh, by reading the directions and following the directions. Okay, so, so once you submit, what I want to do now is to, to just go over this process. So once you submit, what happens, right? So, so you load all this information into the website of the journal, you hit a button, holding your breath, you know, maybe you say a little blessing, <laughs> maybe you have some superstitions, and away it goes. Uh, and so, so I want to spend some time just going through this process. So, so these are the key players, right? You're the author. You've just submitted this, uh, your manuscript that you've worked so hard on. And these are the players in this, this reviewing process. So the managing editor, the editor in chief, associate editors and reviewers. And the constellation of key players is gonna vary from journal to journal. There may be more than one editor in chief. There's always many, many associate editors or sometimes they're called reviewing editors or other, other kinds of designations. Uh, each of those associate editors will have their own areas of expertise and um, reviewers are ad hoc and recruited uh, as needed. Okay, so what happens uh, when your paper comes in uh, is that the first thing that happens is that the managing editor 
takes a look at it and decides, is it appropriate for the journal? So is it botany? If, if, the, if you've submitted to the American Journal of Botany and we're going with that for now, is it even botany? Is it, does it have an introduction, you know, materials and methods, results, introduction, or a discussion, the, the kinds of things that we're expecting? Uh, if not, it goes back to the author without review. If the managing editor considers it appropriate, then it goes on to the editor in chief who then also will look at the paper, uh, look at the title, read the abstract, read the um, uh, cover letter, and, um, and decide, is this a topic appropriate for the journal? Are these the kinds of things we're looking to publish? Does the science clear the bar for what we consider significant, impactful research? Um, if I can't tell from looking at those things, I'll go back and skim the introduction or skim the discussion. Um, but by that time, I'm really grouchy if I can't tell, so be forewarned. Um, and if I decide, you know, for any of those reasons, it's not appropriate for the journal, I'll send it back, return without review, and it comes back to you, hopefully with a polite cover letter. If I decide that it's appropriate, then I'll send uh, your submission to one of our associate editors who will also likely look at the title, the abstract, maybe skim through the paper a bit, um, uh, maybe not, and um, make a decision about whether the associate, that person who's really the expert in the subject area, whether that person thinks it's appropriate. And if that person, who's really the expert, does think it's appropriate, um, they'll send it back to, the, to me, to the editor-in-chief, and I'll send it back to the author as a um, return without review. Sometimes the, I misjudge the associate editor's area of expertise and they send it back to me and I send it to a different associate editor, but um, we try to minimize that kind of, of uh, process. Okay, so if the associate editor decides uh, that it's appropriate for the journal, then the associate editor will um, think about uh, who are the experts in the field and begin to associate, to contact appropriate uh, ad hoc reviewers, that is people who are out in the field, um, have some expertise, and ask them if they can evaluate the paper. And again, the reviewer will read the title and read the abstract and decide whether, first of all, whether they have the expertise to do it, whether they have the time to do it, and whether they're willing to do it. And then they'll say uh, uh, yes or no. Um, they will or won't review it. So I want you to think now about what I've just talk, been talking about. All of these decisions about the fate of your paper have been made based on the parts of that paper that you've probably spent the least amount of time on. And this is really a, a really important thing to think about and a really important part of preparing your paper for publication. So um, I want to go back and talk about those parts that all of these people have been reading in making these really critical decisions, right? So the first thing that I look at, that the associate editor looks at, that the reviewer looks at is the title, right? What is this paper about? And so it's really, really important that you choose a good title. Does, does, is the title effective? Does it actually convey to the reader what your research is about? Is it compelling? Does it, does it make me feel like I have to read this paper? I have to know what's in it. You also want to be mindful that you're, you know, you, you want to get your paper through this editorial process, but ultimately you want scientists in your field to find it. So you also want to maximize what's called search engine optimization. So you want to make sure that Google, Google can find you um, or Web of Science can find you. And so Wiley has some good tips for search engine optimization. They suggest that you keep your title short, that you make sure that you, you have keywords related to your uh, topic in your title. Um, and that, uh, yeah, so short to the point, get your keywords in there. Uh, within the first 65 characters of the title. Uh, okay, so you want to have a good title. And then you really, really want to have a good abstract, right? Because that's how all of these people are understanding what your paper is about. Um, so does it clearly convey what your research is about? Uh, does it clearly state what your uh, question or goals are for your research? 
what did you find out, right? State that really clearly. And why should somebody read, want to read this paper, right? What are, what are your conclusions? What are the key insights that you found out uh, in this research? And again, uh, Wiley has um, uh, tips for research engine optimization, uh, uh, which I'll just let you refer to when you're trying to compare, prepare an abstract. Okay, and then finally, and so the things that these things I'm telling you are uniformly important. I also think that it's really, really important to write an effective cover letter. And so, but so my reasoning is that the cover letter has a different intent than the abstract. The abstract is ultimately the way you're going to communicate with potential readers what your paper is about even though you also have to make sure that that abstract is communicating clearly to the editor-in-chief, the associate, whoops, the associate editors uh, and the reviewers what it's about. But your cover letter is to the editor-in-chief and to the associate editors. And this is your chance to really explain why your paper is important. And you should do it in different words than you use in the abstract. So this is really your opportunity to write in a different way and to make your case that the editor in chief should send your paper out for review. Um, and so I really, um, some people uh, do this in two sentences, dear editor, here's my paper, thank you. Or dear editor, here's my paper and they paste their abstract in it, thank you. Which is just a waste of, of time, right? Because that information is available elsewhere. So I would encourage you to, um, to spend a little time thinking about that. And so I thought uh, maybe this would be a good time to stop um, and ask the panelists if they had any, if they agree or disagree, and if they have any um, advice or um, uh, input on uh, cover letters. And then I have a, an example to share with you. Uh, so panelists. Yeah, so I think that something very important to include in the cover letter is actually which are the new findings, um, which is your area of expertise, and which are the findings that you are adding, like which is the, adv like the advance in the knowledge of that particular area, to make this really clear, um, why this is new and why this is um, advanced, and why would be enter interest for the audience of that particular journal. Absolutely. Anyone have anything to add? Pam, I'll add that this is something that a lot of us struggle with is the self-promotion aspect. And so, you know, we're often uncomfortable saying, well, this is why my paper is amazing. We're more comfortable sitting with the like, the sort of very stripped down scientific language. So it makes sense that people struggle here and are uncomfortable, but it's an opportunity for you to really show your excitement about your project and convey that to um, an audience so it goes much, much further. So sitting with that discomfort and knowing that it's okay and normal for it to be hard, just, just try to do it anyways. That's a really good point. And it might be more comforting to know that the audience for your uh, cover letter is pretty limited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so um, I will, so, so a couple of our panelists shared uh, a cover letter with us. And, um, and so I, I went ahead and um, uh, put one up that uh, Dr. Nora Mitchell had supplied. Um, and this is, you can see that the cover letter doesn't have to be long, right? It's um, just, it's got the salutation there and uh, says what it's about. Um, and says why it should be published. And so um, I'm not gonna expect you to read the small print, but I did um, uh, put up some of the text in uh, uh, larger print. <laughs> and so the, the, uh, Nora begins her, her letter, we're happy to submit our article, and she gives the title and her co-authors. Um, and then she says, straight out, this work is novel, right? right out there telling me, you know, or whoever this is addressed to, you know, this is novel because of this, right? So then she goes on uh, with another paragraph that summarizes the, um, 
content of the paper, but again, in slightly different way than is written in the abstract. So it gives me a little bit different insight into what the paper is about. And again, the particular um, uh, wording here, I'm not gonna, gonna uh, go over just to say, so first she says, this is why it's novel. Second, this is what it's about. And then third, this work will be exciting to the broad readership of your journal because we believe this is, right? And then comes right out and says it. And so it gets, you know, this language is, uh, you know, it's, as Rachel says, it might be hard, but you know, these are the things that you need to say. It's novel, this is what it's about. This is why your readers are gonna be um, interested in it. Um, and then uh, you can, in your cover letter, go on to suggest, um, you can look through the, editorial board and um, and indicate which associate editors might have the expertise necessary to, to handle your paper. And you can suggest reviewers. So here Nora's uh, listed some names and contact information for reviewers. You can also uh, explain why these people are um, back. Is everybody still there? Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> I just got a message that you all signed <laughs> out. Um, <laughs> so um, anyway, so you can also explain why particular reviewers are particularly appropriate for your paper, especially if your paper has it, ha it has um, spans a couple of different fields where you might need people with different expertise. You can explain. You can recommend people that have diverging uh, expertise and and what their particular area is. So um, I think that's a, a good example to, to use. Pam, I just want to add for that journal in particular, I believe the instructions for the cover letter is said to include potential um, associate editors, reviewers. Um, so just like you read the instructions for the rest of your manuscript, do check to see if there are special instructions for that cover letter as well. Yeah. Great. I think um, American Journal of Botany, I know American Journal of Botany in the submission process, you can actually enter the names and contact information of suggested reviewers as well. But this brings up yet another issue that I thought I'd get uh, the input from the panel about um, suggesting reviewers, right? Because different uh, associate editors and, and um, other folks have different opinions on what to do with author suggestions for reviewers. And, um, and I always appreciate them and I always use them. I use my own uh, selections as well. But um, so I thought I'd, I'd uh, see if the panelists had any opinions. Or Teresa too. I, I suggest reviewers if there's someone obvious who doesn't have a conflict of interest, but sometimes I really struggle to know who the right reviewers are. So sometimes yes, sometimes no. I found as an associate editor, it definitely helps to get started, but you also have to vet those people and make sure that they're, um, you know, that they're actually have expertise in what the area the authors say they have expertise in. It's definitely a good starting point because as associate editors, you might get a paper that's in your field broadly, but then the study system is different or some aspect of it is something you're not as well versed in. So it's good to have those people um, to at least get started with. Um, I'll add that for different journals or different times of year or in different years, it can be more difficult to find reviewers. So even if um, that person is uh, not able to do the review at that time, uh, a reviewer who declines to review can then suggest additional reviewers who might be able to um, address that paper. Yeah, excellent point. Yes, I will add also that, for example, when I'm suggesting reviewers, I try to cover the topics that I'm addressing on that particular manuscript. For example, if I'm um, developing this manuscript about um, the evolution of a particular group of plants, I try to address to include reviewers who are experts on that group of plants, as well as um, in the particular methodology that I'm applying. So it's more cover and easier, yes, to others or even to find additional reviewers for that. Marcelo? Yes, I think it's like the, I totally agree with the, with Rocio, I think. And also like as an editor, what I try to do is we have like, we 
we like the reviews that really you feel that the person went in detail in the paper, not only like after a month, send you one line saying it's, <laughs> it's terrible, we don't need it. So we really want like to have the feeling that the reviewer went through the article, took some time and, and really like made some clear comments on that. So for, for us, it's, it helps like also to decide when we are going to send reviews again to some people or not to other people, right? And otherwise, I, I, I don't have anything to add. I think what Rocio said is fundamental, like the experts in the group and the, and the methodologies. And, and for all of you as authors, it's, it's very, I find it very helpful when I'm trying to find reviewers, if you've suggested people who aren't the usual, the usual people, the usual experts that you think of, right? Because those people get asked all the time and they're, it's most likely they're gonna say no. And so if you can think of um, uh, people, you know, sort of cast your, your ideas broadly for who would be appropriate uh, to review your paper. And, and clearly you, you don't wanna uh, suggest friends or colleagues or anyone, you know, you don't, you don't wanna get known for, um, for trying to, to stack the decks in your favor. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. Something else I, I will mention that I have never um, rejected reviewers, like saying I don't want this person to review my manuscript. I don't know if you have a particular experience, like which reasons will be um, like right to say like, oh no, I, I don't want this person to review this manuscript in particular. So, so you're reluctant to do that or you have done it? No, I haven't actually. So I don't know which particular reasons will be um, like, yes, will be the situation to, to suggest that or. Yeah, that's a really good question. So you can uh, say that you would, that you prefer not to have your paper reviewed by um, particular people, but you do need to give a reason. Um, and common reasons are uh, conflicts of interest um, and uh, oftentimes that they're uh, competing lab uh, that you know they're working closely on the same things that you're working on and you would prefer to, to maintain the confidentiality of your work mm -hmm. until it's um, published. Um, uh, so someone just said what counts as a conflict of interest and so so that's interesting right so so you can count things as a as a personal uh, conflict of interest, which people usually don't volunteer in cover letters. Um, so if you have a, a personal relationship uh, with someone, um, so for example, I'm married to another academic, and so having him review my papers is clearly a conflict of interest, but I wouldn't necessarily state that. Um, and, uh, but those are things, I should say actually, this is an aside, uh, but we have pretty strict uh, rules about conflict of interest in place within uh, the American Journal of Botany. Uh, so if any papers come in um, that are by an author, uh, well, if any papers come in that are by associate editors, they're completely blinded. They can't to anything associated with that paper. They can't get into the, um, to the uh, computer system and see any of that. If anything comes in that I have a conflict of interest with, so uh, friends, associates, um, people I've worked with, people at my university, uh, um, I'm blinded to all of that. And the paper then is handled by um, uh, our director at large for publications. Um, so we take conflicts of interest extremely seriously and I'm certain that all that other journals do as well. Um, and I've completely lost my train of thought, but we were talking about what constitutes a, a conflict of interest. And so, um, uh, some people have actually uh, said that um, they've asked that certain people not review their papers because they've had unpleasant interactions with that person before. Um, so, uh, Amy, did you have, I see a comment up about opposing a reviewer. Did you want to chime in for a sec? I was just trying to sort of, um, the things we've seen over the years, it could be a personal, um, a, a sort of a 
personal attack on, on a previous paper, sometimes it's, it gets to be a little less um, objective and more um, nasty in previous encounters. Um, it can be, yeah, competition among labs um, or just, you know, any, any kind of personal reason. It, it's worth bringing up. It, it doesn't mean if you oppose a reviewer it, and that person is the best person to review your paper and you haven't provided a reason why you didn't want them chosen, that might cause a, an editor to sort of scratch their head and say, well, I wonder why they didn't want the best person to review this paper. So um, you can oppose and if you provide a reason for why you don't want that person chosen, it's more likely to be taken into more serious consideration than if you just say, I don't, I don't want this person to look at my paper. So. So. I've seen it all. <laughs> Yes, and Miranda also asked uh, about if uh, she has ever published with someone, do they automatically have a conflict of interest because of that? Uh, and so we tend, I tend to, in my mind, kind of go back uh, to the um, conflict of interest uh, rules that the National Science Foundation of the U.S. uses, which isn't useful information for those of you who are not in the US. But so you, you're in conflict with um, colleagues uh, for a limited period of time. And, and I'd have to go back and, and look up what, what that period of time, but it's not forever. Um, your conflict with your uh, PhD advisor is forever. Uh, your contact, your conflict with your um, uh, postdocs is, I think that's forever as well. Um, your advisor and then those you advise. Um, uh, and tell me the question again. <laughs> I'm sorry, no, it was, uh, the question was when oh, you're right. yeah. if it's someone uh, that you have published something before, yeah. um, if they are automatically have a conflict of interest because of that. And usually, so um, we don't depend on authors to provide that information. Usually uh, reviewers, if we contact a reviewer and we inadvertently um, contact someone who's a close colleague, they'll usually say, and, um, and then we sort of have a dialogue back and forth about, you know, uh, how close the, is the collaboration, how recent is the collaboration and, and go from there. And some fields are so near, are so small, right? That right. The, the best person to review it is gonna, it's gonna have to be somebody you've published with yeah. before. All right, so evidently I had thought that the, I could ask the panelists um, a little bit about uh, your perspective as an author about what kinds of comments from reviewers you found particularly helpful. And Marcelo um, uh, already offered up that really short reviews are not helpful unless they just say the paper's perfect, right? <laughs> that would be a good review. <laughs> um, and so if, if you have a couple of thoughts that you want to share and then we'll uh, move along. Yeah, oh. I also would like to oh, oh. have. I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. I also would like. I would like to know how do you act, Pam, when you get like one review that is really positive and another one that is really negative. <laughs> let's let's go back to that and just uh, talk about uh, review comments. But don't let me not address that, okay? So, so I was going to say that reviews where it's clear that the reviewer actually read the paper and did their best to try to understand the paper. Those are the most helpful ones. Um, I appreciate the line edits myself. So, so generally when I write a review, I have like my, I do a brief summary just for myself and for the editor to, so they know I actually read the paper. And then, um, and then I have, I'll have like my major comments, which are sort of big issues that I, that really need to be addressed. And then I'll have, depending on how well copy edited the paper is, there'll be line comments, just like little things, little little picky issues. And so I appreciate those line comments because it shows that the, the uh, reviewer read really carefully and was really trying to help me. Um, of course, the big issues, I prefer there to be not as many because that means my paper <laughs> needs a lot of work, but, um, but the reviewers are there, there to help make your paper better. And so when they find issues with it, it's not, hopefully they're not out to get you and hopefully their tone is kind and generous and not aggressive. 
and it's clear that they're just trying to help you make your paper better and that these are things that would make it stronger. Um, so that's what I do. That's what I like. Yeah. I agree with Rachel and building off that, you know, constructive criticism is really good and suggestions. Um, so if someone has a problem with the organization of something, they may like suggest like what, you know, consider starting with this point and then building on this. So anything to suggest to actually make it better instead of saying, um, I didn't like this part, they could say, um, this part, I found this section confusing. It might be more clear if you blah, blah, blah. Something that's constructive and actually gives you a direction to head in, I think is really helpful and shows that they are trying to make the paper better, not just trying to put you down, but here, here's how I think this can be improved upon is really useful. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I think that you hit on some of the high points that, you know, I think most reviewers are trying to be constructive um, and the, the most helpful reviews sort of give a general sort of overview, some main points, some specific points, and just saying this is confusing is not very helpful. Um, <laughs> so, um, so let me just see what I, what I was going to do next here. Pam, can I jump in and say one more thing? Absolutely. Is that if your paper isn't clearly written, the reviewer is likely to get grumpy and have a harder time being kind and generous. So it's really, really worth looking over the writing and not just like making your analyses beautiful and making sure you did the methods right, but really like looking at the writing carefully because a paper that's hard to read, it, it's really hard to read. And reviewers are doing this out of their own time when they have other work that they need to be doing too. And so when they're, when it takes them five or six hours to try to understand a paper, it's, it's really frustrating, so. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, um, you know, there, there are certain uh, scientists in our field who have gotten the reputation of depending on reviewers to um, turn their paper from a rough draft to a, the final product and um, nobody will review their papers anymore. Uh, so it, it really is um, to your benefit to, to polish those papers as well as you can. Um, and we had a, a conversation last week about, um, for any of you for whom um, English is an additional language, this puts a, a, you know, a special burden on you. Um, and I think that the grumpy reviewer, um, mo most reviewers um, give quite a bit more latitude to um, if they understand that, that uh, the writer is not, is writing in an additional language, so. So um, for what that's worth. Okay, so now we go back to Marcelo's question, <laughs> right? So, so reviewers have uh, hopefully carefully evaluated your paper based on its entirety um, and have written their evaluation back to the associate editor. And now the associate editor has to evaluate uh, uh, these comments Usually the associate editor will also read the paper and provide comments of their own. Um, excuse me. And so um, more times than not, the reviewers assessments are in pretty good agreement. Um, but sometimes they're not. And that's when it's in particularly important that, that you have an associate editor that, you know, has some expertise in your field and is really able to um, sort of weigh the judgments of uh, both reviewers. Um, and uh, Martello, you can, you can jump in here, but it's usually uh, uh, my experience that if the reviewer recommendations are really different, the, the more negative reviewer saw a pretty fundamental flaw that the positive reviewer missed. And if that's the case, it's you know, pretty easy to, to go with that more negative review. Sometimes negative reviewers are just more picky. And so you have, you know, the associate editor then has to weigh um, all of these, um, you know, sort of the personality of the reviewer, what the reviewer is actually finding fault with, and the personality of the positive review and what they're actually, you know, are, are they just excited about the paper because it's in their field and, um, you know, or, or are they, have they really made a judgment about the quality of the science that's in the paper? Um, so does anybody have anything to add to that? Yeah, now that you mentioned, in fact, actually also for me, I think many times 
um, it was easy to see what was the problem. It was not a, a negative review necessarily because the person is being nasty or anything. It's, it was because it was seeing a major flaw. So yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So that, so then the reviewer has to make a recommendation uh, uh, to the associate editor. Um, and so the, the reviewers will make a recommendation and the associate editors will make a recommendation. And these are kind of the, the range of recommendations that might be made, um, except minor revision, major revision, major revision with additional review, reject with the possibility of resubmission or reject. And I'm just going to forward here. So, so, so the associate editors have sort of evaluated the reviews. They make a recommendation to the associate editor, and then the associate editor is going to make a decision to send to the author. And the basis for these gradations of decisions vary from journal to journal, and they're not all the same. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how I view this and um, you know, with the understanding that this may actually vary from journal to journal. And so um, I, in the seven or eight years I've been doing this, I don't think I've ever accepted a paper uh, straight out. <laughs> Amy, do you think we've ever accepted a paper uh, with no revision? I've lost Everything Amy. can be improved. Yeah, <laughs> okay, right. And I should say, uh, you know, that, that yeah, you know, most, mostly reviews make things better. Okay, so, so, um, so a paper might go back to you with a request for minor revisions. These are mostly uh, just request for clarification, you know, and they're really specific. I didn't really understand what you meant by the sentence or, um, you know, this wasn't the, the, this particular piece of your methods wasn't very clear. Can you explain the experimental design a little bit more clearly? So it's so a really sort of um, minor uh, things that are really meant to improve the clarity and impact of the paper. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I think of as minor revisions. Major revisions are requests that are going to take major revision, right? They're going to take a lot more writing. You may have to uh, revise the introduction to make the goals more clear. Uh, you might have to explain your experimental design or your analyses in um, much more uh, detail. You may have to include um, uh, some uh, uh, interpretations that you hadn't thought of, right? So this is going to require some, you know, major changes in the wording, but um, the changes are such that we think, the associate editor and I think that with, that the associate editor ought to be able to evaluate your revision, right? That it's not, the, the um, changes that are required don't require the expertise of the reviewer to read that revision. If we, if you get a decision of major revision with additional review, that means that that revision really needs to go back to the reviewer because there were questions about the science. And it, the, but still, the, the reviewers and the associate editor and I feel that the science is sound, right? It just may, you may need some more, um, a different analysis uh, or other kinds of clarification that really, really require the expertise of the reviewer uh, to discern whether you've addressed their comments adequately. And then, then um, we might reject your paper with an invitation to resubmit. Again, we think that the paper can rise to the level of acceptability by the journal, but there are just too many flaws in the logic, in the design, in the things that you've included, um, and that the, the science is just not, it's not well supported, it's not well explained, um, but we think, you could, we think you could do it, right? It's just going to take a lot of work. And so by the time you've made those revisions, it's going to be a different paper, and it really should start over again. And then finally, your paper may just be rejected, and that's usually because there's some fundamental flaw that, that we don't think you can address uh, with revision. And so those are the kinds of um, things that you'll get back. Um, so I send you the, the decision back. And then what happens, right? You just got your reviews. And so remember what Rachel said that I got it. my office light thinks I've gone home. Um, you've just got your reviews. So 
first of all, remember that reviewers are trying to help, right? The, the point of the review process is to make your paper as clear and as impactful as possible, right? And so, um, you know, so, but it's, no matter what the reviewers say, you're gonna read the criticisms, right? And you're, that's the thing that's gonna hit you in the pit of your stomach. No matter how many superlatives are scattered through that, that review, you're gonna see the negatives. Um, so, so read it carefully. Um, and if you, know, if you get fixated on the negative parts, then put it away or take a few deep breaths. Um, but don't begin to react in anger. Um, so just, just remember that, that this is all meant to, to try to, to make things better, <laughs> to make the paper better. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and even that paragraph that you sweated and sweated and sweated over, a reviewer might say, this is confusing, right? And just step back and remember that this is a really smart person and they didn't understand what you said, right? And so <laughs> you need to step back and figure out why it is they didn't understand what you said. Um, and so, uh, okay, so, so you've gotten, you've gotten the reviews, you've gotten over the negative parts, you really sort of concentrated on the positive parts, you've taken, as Nora says, the, the really great uh, reviews will say, you know, I suggest that, you know, if this would be clearer if you put this part first and, you know, start trying to, as um, best you can, to, to understand what the reviewers are trying to say to you and to incorporate uh, their suggestions uh, into, um, into your paper. The thing though to remember is that you, you can disagree with a reviewer. Um, you don't have to do everything the reviewer says and the reviewer may not be right, um, or the reviewer may have misunderstood or the reviewer may actually have been in a hurry. Um, and so, so you can also think about uh, what the reviewers are requesting and, um, and decide whether you, whether you think they're correct. Um, and that, so once you've revised, then you will um, include with your revision a cover letter that explains how you've responded to the reviewers. And so um, I think there's an art to, to writing these cover letters to accompany your reviews. And so I thought, might be interesting to hear from the panelists um, about what they like to include in their cover letters with their revisions. I can go first. I like to tell, you know, acknowledge the contributions of the reviewers. Um, I've never had a terribly nasty mean review, but uh, that might be a place if, if you feel like, I don't know if that would be the place to communicate to the editor that you feel like a review is inappropriately um, uh, antagonistic or not, but um, acknowledge the contributions of the edit, of the reviewers and um, yeah, this is different than the response to reviewer, right? Where you go through line by line. You can include that in your cover letter, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and then I summarize the big changes I've made. So I go through and I say, okay, the reviewers made these comments. Here's how I address them, or here's how I didn't address them because they were wrong, and here's why they were wrong with citations, um, and or they fundamentally misunderstood this blah blah blah. So I've clarified it here, and so just detailing exactly how you change the paper and why or why not, um, as politely again as politely as possible. Um, Yeah, I think building off of what Rachel said, it's often good to have that cover letter up front and then include a separate or document or after that initial letter, separate document detailing um, exactly what changes you made more specifically. So for that, I'll usually copy and paste all the comments from reviewers and then one by one go through and have you know, what they said and then my response. And I'll often put that in a different color even, um, a non-antagonistic color, so put it in like blue, 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 red. <laughs> And your response, like, thank you for this comment. We've changed it this way, blah, blah, blah. Even if you think it's really the reviewer's fault for not understanding, you can say, you know, as Rachel said, I clarified further, like, we apologize that this was not clear enough. Here's what we meant to say. We addressed that in these lines and changed that to now more explicitly state whatever. So um, being really kind and even if your gut reaction is to, like, 
how could they think that you know that's your gut reaction that's not what you write in your response letter so addressing those one by one in a, you know after thinking about the major changes like Rachel had talked about is useful and may I jump in and I think it's very useful like if you write when you're saying that you're not going to implement one of the suggestions to say why and put references and explain in detail, not just say we prefer this over there. Only if it's really a matter of like word, uh, word choice or something like this, but usually I think it's useful for the editors that will get the, the review to understand why you're not taking that measure. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's very important. Yes, I think that something important too is um, that who receive your reviews, actually your response to reviewers is the editor and not always the reviewers will get back that. So if you are not following some of the suggestion, it's good practice to leave some proof in the manuscript that actually you address that comment, like saying probably adding some citation or expanding, like including some explanation about the methodology or the, the, the issue that was pointed by the reviewer. Yeah, good point. We always, uh, at AJB, we send the, um, your response, the author's response to the reviewers if it's going to go back to a reviewer so they can see that. The original reviewers, right? I would, I will, I'm just going to jump in here just I've been doing this for a really long time. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uh, back and forth among authors. Sometimes people will uh, respond all. And so sometimes the editorial office will get the, <laughs> the back and forth among authors. I've seen that before. Um, it's often, um, it might be the first reaction, which is a little more negative than it, than it comes at, at the end. So I just caution you about the reply all is, or <laughs> make sure you know who, the, who your response is going to, usually not a problem. Um, also, I really appreciate all of the, the authors talking about the tone of their response letter. Sometimes, um, the editor will read a, a response letter, and if it's kind of snippy and dismissive of, of comments that were made, it, it sets up a, a little bit of a, just a little more um, stress for everyone involved that, that, that is really needed. So being polite and professional is, is um, in your best interest. Thank you. Okay, I think um, the panelists hit on all the things that uh, I was going to say, and I think I have a, a co uh, example in here somewhere, but must have got out of order. Uh, but uh, so what I have on my slide is, so when you're ready to, to submit your revision, you're going to prepare a response to reviewers. And, and so the panelists have emphasized you want to just make this as clear as possible, make it as easy as possible for the associate editor. And if it goes back to the reviewer, reviewers, um, easy for them to understand exactly what you've done. And you want them to be able to not to, unless, you're, unless your paper really required substantive revision, you don't really want it to make it necessary for them to go back and reread the whole paper um, because that just delays the process. And so if you can steer them toward um, the particular revisions that you've made so that they can just go check and see what you did uh, without having to reread the paper again, that's to your benefit because it means things are going to move along uh, more quickly. Um, and then, so as has been pointed out, you want to just take each reviewer comment, comment by comment by comment, and explain what you've done or what you haven't done to that uh, uh, in response to that comment. And so, um, this is an a example from a um, cover letter that I wrote. Um, and you can see, uh, you can't probably read what's written here, um, but this is starts out, you know, dear editor, um, and then uh, explains, you know, how, I, how I've done this, right? And so I explain, uh, I think I have this in, yeah, here we go. So this is how I start, right? Thank you for securing two thoughtful and constructive reviews of our manuscript, right? So say thank you. <laughs> And then explain what you're going to do, right? Below, we explain how we've addressed each comment. Our explanations follow each comment and are in red font. Although Nora says I shouldn't use aggressive font, so I'll do blue next time. <laughs> and we include a track changes version um, of the manuscript and refer to the line numbers on that version, right? So really specifically, this is what we've done. This is where you're going to find the information. 
Pam, I have a question about that, about the track changes version. That is so terrible to read as a reviewer. Like, is that a trend that's increasing? Like, I would never want to re read a track yeah, change. I think the journal actually requested that. I, I like to refer to the line numbers on the, the finished product. I don't, yeah. Um, so uh, some people like it and some people don't. Okay. Yeah. I've seen kind of a half of that, instead of like the track changes in Word where any changes made are highlighted or in a different font and color. That way you can see where they are clearly, but you're not getting the, you know, side panel in Word that's a mess. Okay. So yeah. I don't know if that counts, but I've definitely seen that before. Yeah. Okay. It's just a new trend. <laughs> well, no, yeah, different people like different things, right? all over the map. Yeah. yeah. And the other, the other thing I will say is if you, if you say that you've changed something in your cover letter, sometimes people explain things beautifully in their cover letter, the response letter, but they don't change anything in the manuscript. And that is often where a, an editor or a reviewer who's looking at the paper again will, will trip up. They'll say, they didn't change the manuscript. I thought this was really confusing, but they look at your response letter and say, well, this is, this is so clear, so make sure you know, that, that your, what you're conveying in your response letter is also reflected in the manuscript. So. Yeah, and sometimes um, people are so clear about explaining why they didn't do something that they should have, you know, you think, well, you should have just done it in the first place because that's really clear. <laughs> you should have just written that in the paper. Anyway, so, so sometimes your response doesn't have to be co complicated, right? And so if you see the first paragraph here, I just said, thanks for the suggestion. The wording has been modified as suggested. C lines. 121 to 123, right? So the editor knows where to go and what to look. And the next one, it just says done, right? <laughs> because it was just saying a, a, a change in word. But you know, by providing line numbers, the person doesn't have to go searching around for it. Um, uh, you can disagree, but explain, right? And so here, the reviewer says, I found the quote from someone else's scientific paper to be an odd and not very compelling start to the paper. So we had prefaced the paper with a, a quote from another paper and um, I really like the quote and I didn't want to get rid of it. <laughs> and so I disagreed and I said, we prefer to retain the quote because it succinctly summarizes a great deal of underlying data. The paper is rapidly becoming a classic in phenology research and at least from the ecological perspective, it has been cited 372 times. We could simply state the fa that fact with the selection of references, but the quote strikes us as more powerful and that was fine, right? We just justified it and and and, and, and that was accepted. Uh, in this one, we clearly stuck and struck a nerve. I won't read the reviewer's comment, but they were ticked off at us because of something that we said. And so um, I think one of our panelists said, you know, so be respectful, right? And, and um, so we start out, we see that this could be misinterpreted and it was not our intent to ignore experimental work, right? So sort of address the irritation and and go on and, and um, explain what you've done. And so again, so uh, I put here, how, you know, the, the sentence that we revised in quotes and then directed the reader to where that is in the manuscript. So um, just, just try to make it easy. Um, and, it, and the easier you can make it uh, on the associate editor, the less likely the associate editor is gonna need to send it back to the reviewer. And the easier you can make it on the reviewer, the less cranky that reviewer is going to be about having to look at it again. Um, okay, so um, speaking of how long this should take, I was intending to be done by now so we could chat, but um, <laughs> so, I, so we've gone through this whole process of getting you an initial uh, decision and you've revised and um, the papers come back and and gone out and, and so forth. So, so how long uh, should all of this take? Um, and so this is sort of a, a guess maybe about uh, this whole process. Maybe to, uh, I just took the process through the first decision to, to getting you a response. And so the thing to remember when you're, you're trying to manage your expectations of a response after you've submitted your paper um, is that, that all of this, um, unless you're submitting to nature and science, all of this is done by volunteers, right? Everybody who's doing this, the editor-in-chief, the associate editors, the reviewers, they're all um, professionals with full-time jobs and they're doing all of this um, in addition. Um, and so, uh, you know, they have to fit this into to their schedule. So, 
So it may take a couple of days for the managing editor to process, to intake your paper, check it, to make sure that it meets all of our requirements. Um, and uh, so Amy, Amy just put in the chat, this is a, year's a little different, everything's a little different with the pandemic. Things are taking a little bit longer. Everybody's life is so much more complicated. Um, so, so you might have to add some time for COVID. <laughs> but once I get it, um, I try to move to, to deal with papers in a couple of days. Um, if I'm in the middle of, of something else, it may take till the end of the week before I can um, move it along. So I guessed one to five days getting it to the associate editor. And then it takes a while for the associate editor to, um, to evaluate the paper, decide if it's in uh, their area of expertise, um, uh, and to finally uh, send me back a notification that they, they'll deal with it. And then they have to find reviewers, which is often exceedingly time consuming because everyone is super busy, right? And so the associate editor has to, to think about what the paper is about, um, uh, maybe invite some of the reviewers that you've suggested, but they'll also want to re invite reviewers that you haven't suggested, um, which means they're uh, thinking about their context. They're going through Google Scholar to try and get a range of reviewers. Um, they're using all the tricks that they know to find people with the appropriate expertise who will agree to review your paper. And this can actually take some time because it, it takes the time for the reviewer to um, to come up with the appropriate person, to ask that person, for the person to respond that yes or no, they'll do it. And, and if that person says no, then they have to go ask another reviewer. So this can be actually a, 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 a time consuming step in the process. Once it goes to the reviewers, um, it's gonna, they're gonna have to fit it into their busy schedule um, in order to read it. And, and um, I don't know about the rest of you, but when I review a paper, it usually takes me most of a day um, to, to give a careful review. Um, and so it's hard to find a whole day that you can spend doing that. Um, and so that's also, you know, a, a pretty substantial um, uh, part of the time process, time, time requirement. Um, and so that can take, you know, anywhere from 15 to even 30 days to get a response back from a reviewer. Then the associate editor, as we talked about, has to um, read through the the reviews, provide their own evaluation, synthesize uh, what the reviewers say, make a, a recommendation back to the editor-in-chief. And then I have to do the same thing. I read all the reviews, I read the associate editor's um, uh, recommendation, I may look at the paper again, and then I make a final uh, decision to you. So that's going to take maybe another uh, uh, one to five uh, working days. And um, so if we add all that up, Oops. Best case, maybe you can get a response in four weeks, but that's super rare. That's when everything goes magically in your favor. Um, before COVID, the average time for first decision at the American Journal of Botany was 33 days. That is from the time you uh, put it into the portal till you got a decision from the editor-in-chief. Um, uh, uh, the first decision, you know, a little over a month taking a little bit longer now, but there's quite a bit of uh, variance um, in that. Um, and just a piece of advice that if you if it is taking a lot longer than you think it is, should be, um, you should contact the editorial office and we will, um, sometimes your letter helps us to um, inquire, to make a polite inquiry through either to the reviewers or to the associate editor and that often helps move things a little faster. Exactly, yes. And especially now, again, the pandemic has just made all of this uh, uh, much more uh, difficult. Um, so, uh, so I went into some detail about uh, the processes involved in, in um, all of the evaluation of your paper. And so I just want to say a few things now about what happens once your paper has been accepted, or at least tentatively accepted. Uh, so after um, the uh, reviewers are satisfied, after the associate editor is satisfied, after I'm satisfied, uh, your paper is tentatively accepted. And then it goes to our content editor who's going to look over your paper for con 
confirmation conformity <laughs> conformity to all of the journal uh, requirements. So all of the formatting requirements and so forth that uh, you might have already looked at on the website, um, she'll look through that. And one of the things that I wanted to um, to emphasize is um, data availability. And so someone has a, a question. Do you want to go ahead? Maybe you can type it in. Sorry. Talk, talk to the person with a question. If you would type it into the chat, then we'll come come back. I'm gonna carry on. Uh, so, so one of the things that the content editor is looking for uh, when she's looking over your tentatively accepted paper is that you have all of our required sections in your paper, and one of the really critical ones is a data availability statement. And so um, uh, data availability is becoming um, much more uh, prevalent and, um, and authors and readers are focusing on making, uh, on open science, on making the data that underlie your paper available, freely available. Um, so uh, we have a data availability policy at the American Journal of Botany right now that we encourage all authors to archive data, code, and any other information integral to the published research, but not contained in the paper itself. And this is about to be changed from strongly encouraged to required. We're going to begin requiring you to archive the specific data that underlie your paper, not your you know, entire data set or, or whatnot, but the specific data that underlie that paper. So be prepared. Um, for that. Make sure that your, your data are in um, good shape and you have something that you wouldn't be embarrassed to post. Um, and, uh, and so we'll require that these, uh, your data are posted in a publicly available um, platform such as Dryad or Figshare, GitHub, GenBank, MorphBank, TreeBase. There's um, many and we can help you with uh, links to that information um, when you need it. Uh, Amy, you look like you were going to say something. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I did want to, you know, just uh, give everybody a heads up that this is coming to most journals soon. If it's if it hasn't arrived, that they're already, and so you should be ready to uh, make your data data available. Okay. So so now your paper's been accepted. You've got all the sections in there. You've got your data available. You've deposited all your vouchers, all the things that we want you to do. Your paper's finally accepted. And then what happens at American Journal of Botany is that it goes to copy editors, which is not the case for all journals. And you can tell when you read those papers that they haven't been carefully copy edited. And we're super, super proud of our copy editors. They're terrific um, and really uh, improve the quality of um, you know, even the best of us make mistakes and I'm constantly learning uh, new rules of grammar from our copy editors. I'm, I'm just super impressed with them. So your paper will go to copy editing and that takes a while, um, uh, about a month or so um, after uh, we get your final, uh, uh, final version. Um, but once the, once the paper's copy edited, it will come back to you um, and you can approve. We don't just make changes without your approval. So you can read the copy edited version and approve or not approve the edits. Um, and then the copy edited version uh, gets uh, goes back and gets turned into a page proof. And there's all kinds of amazing magic that happens in turning a word file <laughs> into something that can actually go online. Um, and a lot of things have to happen to, to, to um, turn something into a proof. Um, but once it happens, you'll be contacted by the journal with these page proofs, which is sort of a facsimile of what it's going to look like in the um, finished version. And you have a really short time to respond. Um, usually it's three days. And so when you're sort of expecting that it's time to get page proofs back, you should be watching your email. And, um, and expecting these and, and know that you're gonna have to spend some time looking at them. Um, 
And when you look at your page proofs, this is really your last chance to find errors. And you're just going to have to live with whatever you don't catch on those page proofs is going to be there in perpetuity. <laughs> so it really is important to look at these carefully. I think one of the very best um, ways to, to do a page proof is to have your computer read your um, copy edited Word version to you as you follow along the proof to make sure that all the words are as you wanted them and all the numbers are in the tables and all the figure legends are as you wanted them and the figure legends are in a, or the figures that are in the place that you want them and the tables are in the place that you want them and all of that. Um, the page proofs will contain queries that you need to respond to and have some pretty uh, uh, detailed directions. So I just wanted to get that out there that uh, page proofs are really important really, really important to make a quality paper and you don't have very long uh, to look at them. Once you return the page proofs and they're processed again, then your paper goes online, um, online early view, uh, and it will be there until it uh, is included in an issue. And uh, both AJB and apps are online uh, journals. Uh, and so it will ultimately be included in an issue with a you know, a, a volume issue and page numbers um, online. And then I want to close by highlighting um, that most journals provide uh, really terrific social media services. And so at the American Journal of Botany, and I suspect at apps as well, uh, once your paper is online, uh, we publicize it on all of our social media platforms. So Twitter, face, Facebook, Instagram, um, and we have uh, 47,000 followers um, on these platforms combined. Um, so we, we really, really take promotion of your work um, seriously and, um, and, and work at it. It's terrific if you include photos with your final submission that we use those for the social media and think about including uh, cover options as well uh, uh, for um, American Journal of Botany. Um, I... Okay, so I was hoping to, to leave some time for questions. We have a, a bit of time, so maybe I'll ask the panelists first if they want to add something, and um, Teresa as well, and then uh, see what the, the audience has to say. Anybody have anything to add? Okay, um, there were, so what's been going on in the chat? Can we address any of those questions or? Uh, let's see. Someone asks about uh, GenBank. How can we um, trust GenBank? Data, bed, data set in our analysis, this is a big problem. Maybe the reviewer may ask us how you confirm the identification of these plants when you're not sure about the species identification. How do you use the available data from GenBank? Can anyone? Not a clue. Anybody else want to <laughs> try that one? <laughs> well, this is Teresa. I could take a stab at it. Um, so I think the question is, how can you use data from GenBank if you're not sure about the authentic, authentic, if you're not sure how accurate the identification is that the person posted it, perhaps that's the question. Um, what I would do if that's the case is in the GenBank, it always has a reference and you might want to go back to the reference. Ideally, that should be linked to a voucher specimen. So that's why it's so important to include voucher information because if you could see the voucher, you know, in some cases it would be digitized and available online. You don't have to request it, but that would be for certainty if you want to make sure that what is on GenBank is the species that you're interested in. I would try to search for that voucher. If you can't find a voucher, contact the authors who submitted that to GenBank and post your question to them. They should be able to um, help you there. Yes, and also in the last years, it's a good practice to include the voucher information with a sequence in GenBank. So sometimes it's uh, all is specified there, 
Um, so you don't need to trace back to the reference to the paper actually where that sequence was used because all the information is actually in GeneBank. I was just going to add those. Nobody double checks that you, that the authors, like if they submit a whole bunch of sequences to GenBank and then associate them with the vouchers, nobody double checks to make sure they're right. So it is a big problem that, that they don't always align. And I have not in plants, but in a study I did on turtles, haplotypes listed in GenBank were not the ones actually in the papers. So, um, it can be a big problem. That's a big challenge. But I think maybe the question comes from a misunderstanding that we aren't telling you that you need to use data from GenBank, but that you need to put your data there and hopefully do it correctly. Any other questions from the audience? Something that I would like to ask actually <laughs> is that uh, a lot of journals have included in the last few years the graphical abstract. Is there any um, idea from AGV or the Applications Plant Science to include this as well? Or no? We haven't um, talked about it very much. What's your, what, what did the panelists think about the utility of graphical abstracts? I really like the graphical abstracts actually, because then it can be used also, as well in social media. Um, and it's a way to, uh, to integrate. And because it's submitted with the first version of the manuscript, it's a good way for the editors and the reviewers to see quickly what this paper is about in addition to the abstract. So. Do you see that as something prepared by the author? Or, or, or do you um, want to see that um, with help from the publisher? I always prepare my graphical abstracts, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, right, okay, perfect. <laughs> so it's uh, something like, yes, the author made, I think. I don't know. Yes, good, yes. So I know they show up in the table of contents, but if someone, um, it feels like most people don't discover papers from looking at tables of contents anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, so the graphical abstract would be used on social media, but it wouldn't show up like a Google Scholar search or anything like that, right? No, I don't think so. Yes, it's uh, probably most useful for social media and um, when the, the paper is not uh, open access, you can access to the abstract as well as the graphical abstract. So it's something else there that it's kind of open access for, yeah, for everyone. I think that's something that we talk about often or not often, but frequently with Wiley and it's certainly something we can pursue. Because I think too that, that uh, when they're done well, they're they yeah. say a lot in, in just a little space, yeah. I say one quick, I see a um, question in the chat about submissions from other countries. Um, and that's something I think that's really important to, to reference. Um, I think, well, I can tell you for applications of plant sciences, of course, we welcome submissions from all over the world as is uh, American Journal of Botany. And there, I think the priority would be, that's how that cover letter is so, so important. So if you're from a different country, and the concern here in the chat is um, if it's a regional, you know, a paper might be perceived as just being regional. That's where that cover letter is so important. You need to talk about how your paper is important, why it should be published in the journal that you're choosing. So that, I think, would be critical um, in that. Yeah, because all work is done somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Pam, there's another question too about um, reject with the possibility of resubmission and how's that different from major revisions? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question and um, it differs from journal to journal. So some journals, um, unless the revisions required are fairly minor, 
they, the decision is, is reject, resubmit. Um, so if the, and, and my understanding is that this is based on the desire to, for the journal to appear to have rapid turnaround, right? And so if they send it back to you and it's gonna need a bunch of revision, it's not gonna come back for a while and it's gonna show up in the journal records as you know, a really long delay between when the paper was submitted and, and when it was accepted. So, so some journals are just playing that game. Um, my uh, preference is to um, work with authors to the best of, of our ability um, to make a really great paper. And, and so, you know, my feeling is, you know, that if the, if the authors, you know, have some good science and, and um, it just needs some work to, to really focus in on making that science really clear and, and um, powerfully presented, um, then that's a, a major revision or, or a revision with additional review. A rejection is, is really when the, the revision is going to be a new paper. If it's going to need some, some more data analysis, some more experiments, sort of a, a, a change in the way the, the paper is crafted, you know, what the focus of it is. Um, and so we still feel like there's some really good science in there that, that really um, needs to be communicated to the, to the um, community. Um, but it's just not, it's not communicated well enough for us to see a way forward. Um, so, so is that clear? It's really sort of, in both instances, we're, we're really trying to work with authors to, to produce a, a, a great paper. Um, but if, it, if the revisions that are um, so extreme that it will be a different paper, then it, it, it's rejected and, and uh, resubmitted. Pam, if I can hop in real quickly, yeah. I'd like to just say, especially for beginning authors, is when you get the decision letter, read it carefully, because I've had some students who have come back to me and said, oh, it's over, you know, my paper wasn't accepted. And then I said, can I look at your letter? And you could read, I'm like, no, 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 these are just major revisions. You have a chance. You need to bring it back, you know, and work on that. They're telling you what to do. So some people don't quite understand, you know, the letter when they read it, they might immediately go towards it's not being accepted. Whereas, you know, the, the journal is indicating that no, they do want to work with you. They think it has potential. And so you need to send back another revision. Yeah, and I try to explain the basis for my decision in, in those kinds of letters. Um, but you know, with, some, with more or less success. I saw a comment, I can't somehow get the comments to come up, but somebody had a, another question. The question is asking about, um, I got reject with resubmit recently and was confused because they said I had three months to resubmit. So thinking about deadlines for resubmissions with a reject and resubmit. That's a question for Amy. <laughs> no, we don't usually um, have a, um, a time limit for a resubmit. So sometimes it's in a few months and sometimes it's a year later. And you know, lots of things can happen. Um, it's important if you resubmit that we have a detailed uh, response letter so that it's the evaluation um, goes faster on the second round. And I have to say that, you know, a lot of times, you know, the papers that were rejected and resubmitted come back a lot stronger. And they're, you know, sometimes they're the paper we choose for a highlight for the journal. And sometimes, you know, they get highly cited. And so a rejection does not mean the paper is no good. You should throw it away and, you know, quit science or anything. Most papers get accepted, you know, it, it just somewhere, you know, and, and some time. And sometimes they just need more work. So if it um, has a good core, then it, it, it will find it, the light of publication. Yeah, that's a good point, though. For resubmissions, we still do need a cover letter that says what you've done. Revision. Um, so I'm seeing that it's um, been an hour and a half, and if no one has um, a burning question, I'm going to just thank our panelists again um, for <laughs> terrific contributions and, and insights into to this um, uh, complicated process of, of getting your paper published. So thank you very much for your participation and thanks to the audience for uh, hanging in there with us and for attending.
And Pam, if I could just hop in, we should have this posted within, I think maybe a day or two. We'll see how, how that is, but it will be on the YouTube, the YouTube channel that Amy had put earlier in the chat. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Nora. Good luck in your publishing endeavors. <laughs> I was gonna say, remember, remember the editorial office is your friends. <laughs>